Olá, olá. Tá bom. Olá, boa tarde a todos. Hoje vamos iniciar mais um seminário né, da pós-graduação. E o convidado de hoje é o Carlos Guerreiro. O Carlos ele tem é, graduação, mestrado e doutorado pela Faculdade de Ciências da Universidade Nacional Autônoma do México. Né? O doutorado é em Astrofísica, pelo Instituto de Astronomia da mesma universidade. O Carlos ele está aqui como atualmente é, como astrônomo residente no Observatório Nacional. Né? E ele, a, a linha de pesquisa atual do Carlos é... E está voltado em estudos de alta resolução espacial, estudo de estrelas binárias, aglomerados abertos, evolução estelar e astroestatística, com interesse especial em instrumentação astronômica. Carlos, gostaríamos de agradecer o seu aceite e podemos iniciar. Okay, obrigado, Felicita, obrigado pelo convite, muito prazer estar aqui. Vejo muitas caras novas desde a última vez que eu apresentei aqui, né? já tem vários anos. E, Infelizmente, eu vou apresentar em inglês, porque <risos> não dá para apresentar em português. né Tem muitas palavras técnicas que eu nem sei como traduzir, então... <risos> Bem, vou, vou trocar agora para o inglês. Então, qualquer coisa, vocês podem me preparar e perguntar na hora, tá? Uh, then, I will talk about this uh, suite. It's a, a software that we developed at UNAM. It's a, a, a library for general ray tracing. I will define what's, what is it that I'm talking about. And it's called Kraken OS, Kraken OS. I, I will, it's, it's a joke, <laughs> the name really it's a joke. I will comment later. So let's begin. I think most of you are, are familiar with optical simulation. Optical simulation, you can see it from your computers to video games to movies and of course industry and science, okay? Uh, optical simulation is used to study the behavior of light as it passes through several different media, right? Optical elements, um, optical uh, medium, air, water, etc. right? What we want to do is to study the behavior of light after passing through those media. Uh, we can modify in an optical simulation, we can modify the, the shape, the optical properties, the elements, everything, the, the geometry, the composition, the mechanics, the temp temperature, etc., of the elements and of the media to try to study the behavior of light, right? Wha what's the, 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 the goal? It's to simulate actual physical conditions, thus allowing us to study the effect on the li light's path, okay? Uh, what we can achieve with this is image quality, energy distribution, uh, optical aberration, and tolerance analysis. This is, for, for example, for designing, okay, of optical elements. Um, what is ray tracing? Ray tracing, it's uh, um, a principle, it's based on Fermat's principle, which is tells us that the light will, tra will travel from point A to point B through the minimal distance, okay? It's an extremal uh, principle, um, like Hamilton's principle, for example, uh, and that's the base, the basis of the ray tracing, okay? Ray tracing is used, like I said, in designing of optical systems, like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I will say optical many times in this presentation, so. Um, optical systems, lenses, mirror glasses, crystals, etc. And in visualization, like I said, like for example, video games, right? Um, I, I'm referring to video games because it's very current now. And for example, for those of you who like to play video games, <laughs> the new consoles, PlayStation and Xbox, just now, recently, we're able to include actual ray tracing. What we saw in previous generation, we, we saw the, these images were very nice, but now we can actually have as a point of light, uh, an emanating source of light, and trace the, the point which will interact with the surface and, and reflect or diffract or refract, right, physically, which could not be done before because the computational 
processing power is too heavy, okay? Uh, well, ray tracing is based on geometric optics. Um, this describes the most physicists will, I think, <laughs> study geometric optics in the, in the graduation. It describes the propagation of light beams through optical systems, right? And we can study the resulting image at the end of the interaction. Mm. However, in order to, to perform ray tracing, we need a ray tracer, right? <laughs> Which is what I'm going to show you. Um, let's see. What effects we can study in a ray tracer? We can integrate many different geometric considerations. For example, like dispersion, chromatic aberration, changes in polarization states, um, interference effects, we can have rough surfaces, we can have many, many configurations we, which we can change, we can modify, we can uh, well, alter it in order to study, like I said, the behavior of the light passing through that optical element, right? Um, I'm going to tell you that many ray tracers treat light as vectors, right? We can have light behaving like particles, we can have light behaving like waves, right? However, most, if not all, ray tracers will treat light as vectors. They will have a di direction, they will have magnitude, but we cannot treat them as waves, at least not yet. Okay, so all interactions are not optical physics, it will be geometric physics that I will talk about. So, um, just a, a comment. Then before the advent of computers, of computational heavy power, ray tracing was performed by hand, right? For example, to, 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 this, to optimize a photographic lens, for example, the calculation should have, uh, will have to be done manually by hand using just trigonometry, okay? And Optic, optical loads. Um, what I mean by optimization, because I will retrieve this concept later, optimization is the calculation of the thickness of the elements, the curvature radius, the conicity constant, etc. Okay, this is the optimization. Which combination of those parameters will result in a, in, in a focused image? Okay? Uh, nowadays, of course, like I'm talking, I'm saying, we use optical design software, okay, to perform these calculations. We now can trace millions of rays at the same time. Okay, so the idea behind ray tracing is very simple. Um, we have two methodologies to calculate this uh, resulting optical path. One of them, it's called paraxial ray tracing uh, or matrix ray tracing, okay? This was the, before what I'm going to, to, to tell you, it's a like generalization of this, what I will describe later. So paraxial ray tracing treats optical elements as matrix. We have the refraction, it's called in, in quotes, refraction, because we can have also uh, reflection and diffraction. And diffraction and transmission. So in this diffraction, refraction matrix, we have the optical elements, and the transmission, we have the distances between the elements. Okay, the resulting system will be the multiplication of every optical element in that system. This is a multiplication, right? And what we will co uh, calculate at the end will be the focal length. That will be the result of this operation. However, Paraxial ray tracing is limited, okay? Why it's limited? Because then it's implied in the name. Paraxial means that it's only valid if the, the traced ray is parallel or over the optical axis and very near the optical axis, okay? If we go to a regime outside, of course, there's a um, quantitative, <laughs> de it depends on the system, right? It's not qualitative. If we go outside, some limit of the paraxial regime, this will not work, okay? 
In addition, you saw the multiplication of matrix. You know, mathematics of matrix, it's not commutative. It's very complex. So because, given because of this, we cannot simulate a, la a system composed of many, many optical elements, OK? Like I said, if it's limited to the paraxial region, you cannot model large surfaces. And <laughs> well, like I say, it, if it's not useful, outside of the paraxial area, OK? So well, um, one, one thing that is very good that this uh, process allowed was the implementation of rotation and displacement of optical elements because um, analytic geometry, you remember your class, right? With these matrices, we can rotate, translate uh, optical uh, planes in, this sp in space, right? So this set the basis, the basis for what I'm going to tell. So exact ray tracing. Many, it's, it's like a pretentious <laughs> name, I never liked it. It's also known as skew ray tracing. So what's a skew ray? It's a ray that it's neither parallel to the optical axis, neither over the optical axis. So every other ray, it's a skew ray. It can be in any configuration. Because of this, it enables, it, it enables us the, to, to trade arbitrary rays even outside the paraxial region, right? We can describe, for example, if we have one, one emitting source will an object O1, like I'm saying there, it will be in a plane, and we don't need the Gaussian approximation, which is the small angle approximation, right? And taking advantage of Snell's law, we can calculate the resulting angle of deflection after the interaction between two media, right? You don't know if you remember this, but it's very straight. However, we are not working <laughs> in plane, we are working in 3D space, so we will take advantage of the um, vectorial form or s of Snell's law, right? Don't worry, none of you will span this. <laughs> it's very ho horrible. And then, you, you will think that we can perform this calculation analytically, right? And you won't be wrong. I say that Fermat's principle is an, extrem uh, an extremal principle which can be expressed in terms of lagrange euler equation, equations, okay? They will calculate the, the path integral of the minimum trajectory of the ray of light. Of course, we can do that for a simple object, but <laughs> if we keep on adding optical elements, this becomes exponentially more complex to solve analytically. So it cannot be done manually, just numerically, which is what we want, actually, right? In this configuration, we can trace from one ray to one million ray to 10 million rays, and the only limitation will be our computational power. Then we will have a very strong computational strength, okay? For I, I will retrieve the, the example of video games. If you set your, your console, and they, they work now with um, solid state hard drives, right? They are very fast. Com to perform calculation. However, if you set your console to ray tracing, you will need to limit the, the frames per second that the, the console is able to process, right? You have to compromise. If you want a truly real experience of ray tracing, you will have to limit the, the, the um, frequency of the images. So it will be more real, but it will be more slow, okay? Even when even though they have very strong processes, right? Well, let's see uh, a little geometry. Then uh, I say that we will treat rays as vectors. So a vector is defined in space by two points, an origin point and a direction point. So P0 and P1. Uh, but we will parameterize these rays in order to have control over the position, right? Across the, the travel. So we, we do that by means of the direction cosine, cosines. So it's just a parametrization of the coordinates, right? And R being the magnitude of the vector. Okay. 
then if we have uh, a system, an optical system, we will have, um, well, I can, <laughs> ah, yes, yeah, here. Then we, we will have our surface, and now our emitting light source is here, right? We have, um, it's now called P minus one, right? Because it's before <laughs> our actual surface. So we have a ray em emanating from here with these direction cosines at the distance, and it will in interact with the surface at some point P0, right? Using Snell Snell's law, we will calculate the deflection or not, if and it will come out if it has some thickness, for example, at point P1, right? And then if we have an, a subsequent surface, we will calculate all the trajectory. That's ray tracing. Then the fundamental problem we're trying to solve is to find the intersection point with any given surface at any given time, right? Um, a surface can be defined as an arbitrary function, mathematical function in 3D space. Ho however, the most in, in optics, in our work, for example, <laughs> the most common are conical surfaces, right? Define it by the Sagitta function, which is the general equation for conical sections, right? We have uh, C, which is the in inverse of the radius, the curvature radius, the conicity constant, which is related to the eccentricity, and S is the distance to the vertex of the conical section. Of course, the conicity constant is related to the type of conic, section, of conic section we are working with. Okay. Then, regardless of the mathematical function we are working, we're dealing with, the, the resulting e system will be the, the sum, the sum of every optical element across our entire system, right? Okay. So how we do we? find the intersection point? Well, we will use the direction cosines and the equation of the subject, and we, we will intersect them, and we'll find the minimum, and we, we will calculate the, the intersection point through a uh, numerical derivative, right? This is like a regular intersectional point calculation, numerical calculation. But how do we see this? Well, now we have all the tools that we need to perform ray tracing over surfaces, right? We will have uh, an uh, incoming ray that will hit a surface in some point. It, through Snell's law, it will change direction. We will, we will calculate the intersection point, and etc. Subsequently, until the last surface up, up to the image plane. Ima image plane is where the optical system will focus or not Fox, but <laughs> we'll hit. Okay. Mm, ah, right. We can perform, like I said, many, many, many operations. In addition of changing the, the shape of the surface, we can change the, the relative and absolute position of the elements. We can change the, 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 the material. We can change the, change the um, temperature. We can change many many properties, and some of the uh, we also we can also change them in space, right? We can, like I said, rotate them, translate them, and tilt them. D d are three different things. For example, we can have a, a, a surface here. We can rotate them, we can displace them, and we can tilt them. Tilt them is in over an axis. Rotating it will be over other axis. Okay, and we have <laughs> the tran the translation matrices. And, and like I said, many more, many more things that we can do to these objects. We can include properties of reflection, of refraction, or diffraction. For example, we can have um, an optical surface composed of, of stripes. And what is that? What is that? A diffraction grid, right? And we can calculate the diffraction order, we can change the media over after the, the, inter the optical element. We can change the energy of the rays, which is related to the mm -hmm. wavelength. 
etc. Okay, we have men, uh, much control over the whole system. And then, there are commercial solutions. Of course, there are. I don't know if men, uh, some of you will know will know them. The, the standard in the industry, in the academy, in the academy, mm, uh, it's Optic Studio CMAX, right? But you can see <laughs> the the licensing, the, the cost of the licensing. It's too heavy for sometimes for small institutions, right? And this is yearly. It's not like you pay one one license and you will have them for forever. No, we also have code V optical design Oslo's um, suite. There are solution um, commercial solutions to, to perform this. Um, like I said, the, the standard, the comparison. <laughs> It's, it will always be CMAX because they have many resources. And they also have like a, a, a programming, an own programming language, which can be translated into Python. But you have to pay for that. And, or C++, you can, of course, you can create your, the, to your developments and then cr uh, tr traduce them into CMAX programming CPL but you have to pay for that. So it's not the best solution, right? I said that I, I was going to comment about the name of our library. It's Kraken OS, because in order to <laughs> have CMAX, we could crack CMAX, right? And that's what it's done, unfortunately. But we are proposing an alternative, which is, of course, not at the level of CMAX, <laughs> uh, but it's getting there. So, um, obviously, we're not pretending to substitute CMAX. We just want to make them feel uncomfortable because we, they have already reached us. <laughs> um, oh, there are free solutions. Of course, there are free solutions. PyTools, Optics, Py, Light Pipes, Ryoptics. For example, PyOptics allows the, the user to include a spherical surfaces. I will, I don't know if you have heard about the spherical surfaces. I will show you one example. Um, but it's very limited. And then, for example, Optics Pi, it's just the 2D representation, but it allows the user to perform non-sequential ray tracing. I told you that I we, we will trace a ray, and it will pass through subsequent surfaces, right? Well, we can also do non-sequential ray tracing, but this was the first open source code that allowed the user to do that. And then we have, for example, 3D optics, which is this. And if you remember your, your optic classes, we, you, you have these tails, right, with holes, and we can mount an experiment with lasers. Well, you can do that online, calculate some things, but it's, it's in quotes free because the only objective of this suite it's for you to design an experiment and then buy the, the pieces, the, the physical optical elements, right? You cannot do anything with that, just visualization. Then, why Python? Well, most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with Python, right? It, the philosophy of programming with Python, it's very clean. It's a you, you code with very clear syntax. Mm. Well, it's at the user level. Uh, it's open source, right? It's multi-platform, cross-platform. You can we can have m Python in Windows, Mac OS, Mac OS, and Linux. Uh, and it allows us to program in two different paradigms: the traditional, which is the functional programming that it's straight, or the object-oriented, orient right? Which is what we will take up advantage of. And there's many documentation available, of course. And there are many libraries that we can incorporate into our analysis. Of course, NumPy, which is um, a library of Python that uh, uh, provides support for mathematical operations with vectors and matrices. 
which is what we are, I showed you <laughs> at that very high level, and we can operate in multi-dimensional multi analysis, right? So this is very useful for us. And we have also visualization toolkit, which is VTK. Uh, it's an open source, also library. It's not in Python, but we have PyVista, for, for example, to translate into Python. And, and VTK is used everywhere to create these kinds of tessellated images. For example, video games, again, <laughs> use VTK, VTK. And each of these points is an inter of these nodes of the bunny, it's an intersectional point, right? Then we have the coordinates. Well, VTK is used for many, many applications, even 3D impressors. Um, well, it's very, very useful. We will use VTK and PyVista to uh, plot our, our codes or elements, okay? Also Matplotlib, of course. So, oh yes, yes, Kraken. We are talking about Kraken. Kraken is, like I said, optical simulator for ray tracing, exact ray tracing. We also can do matricial, matrix ray tracing. It's built under the object-oriented programming paradigm, if you, you're not familiar with that. Uh, it's a model of programming that in which you encapsulate your functions. For example, you will define um, a lens with all of its properties and you will store them in an array. And this will be an object, okay? And you can, you can do all of your calculation over that object, okay? Rather than an, uh, a continuation of flowing of functions. But then, well, it's very practical. Um, all of the internal functions of Kraken OS are open source, so you can, if you don't like what you are seeing, for example, in, in CMAX, you cannot change the color of the, <laughs> of the wavelength. You know? it, it's a black box. You, you receive and you use. Kraken, it's not the same. You, the user can open the box and perform its calculations, modifications, etc. It's designed of, because of this, it's designed for to grow with the user's requirements, okay? And there's a, like I said before, uh, many, many, many optimization codes, plotting codes, numerical analysis, um, et cetera, tools already written in Python that KrakenOS can integrate seamlessly, okay? Yes, I'm selling KrakenOS. <laughs> Um, Kraken OS treats surfaces as objects. Then we will have two main class objects, which are the surf class, which is um, a cl uh, an object that defines the properties of each surface in an array, like I said before. Which attributes? We ca there are many attributes, like radius of curvature, diameter, conicity constant, Material, space coordinates, shape, etc. And then when we we define every surf class class of our system, we will define the system class, which will enca encapsulate every object of the surf class, okay, belonging to a system, which will also be an array in sequential order, order of position, right? Not of, of ray tracing. Then, well, how does Kraken operate? Y we will have a configuration array, which we, 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 we can put all of our config con conditions for the, for the media and for the space where we will create our designs. And then we will have our surfaces, right? We, in these examples, w I will always show you the object planes the object plane, which is the position of the first surface. Then we will have the image plane, which is the last um, surface where the light will be focus. And then we will have our in-between elements, like lens phase one, lens phase two, etc. Then we will create the object of, cla of surf class A, which will be composed of the object plane, the first lens, the second lens, and the image plane. And then we will create an objective, like a, a, like a lens objective, composed of 
all of the objects of the surface class, surface class contain it in an object called system, right? Which will have these configuration parameters. And in Kraken, you can manipulate all these parameters. Again, radius of curvatures, thickness, diameter of the elements, um, conicity constant, which type of class, displacement, et cetera, et cetera. How this representation in, in an another way. We, we will have, we will define uh, the object plane as a surf object, uh, as a surf class object. We will have the first lens, the second lens, and the image plane, right? Well, I, I, I cannot provide you every detail of Kragen, but there's um, a sign, um, how do you say? <laughs> Convention, okay? If you measure the, 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 the distance to the left, it will be negative. If you measure to the right, it will be positive. I'm saying because I will use example with which will have negative uh, unities of distance and you will think it, it's strange. It's because of the sign convention, okay? And then we will create the lens object. So once we have the, the, the encapsulated object, uh, lens, uh, optical elements, then we will create the system which will have other more global par characteristics. And the number of surfaces, the list of classes, intersectional points, direction cosines, etc. Okay? But in order to perform ray tracing, we also need a ray container, which is another class of Kraken. Okay? Uh, it's different from the, the surf and system because it only contains the coordinates, the energy, and the directional cosines of the rays that we want to trace, okay? And mo some of them will hit the surface, some of them will not. All of this information will be contained in this ray keeper. Um, and maybe you we want to, to trace rays in one wavelength and more rays in another wavelength, then we will have two Ray containers, and then these will be arrays of arrays. Okay. Okay. One more class, and we will I will show you <laughs> an example. The setup class, which is mm, only functionality is to configure the environment. You s you have seen the the config that that I have showed you, right? In here, for example, the config. Well, it will be contained in the up in the setup class. Okay. Like I said, Zemax is the standard, so if we want to use a, a glass, we will have to use Zemax glasses. Okay. Let's create, oh, well, well, first, we need to import Kraken, right? So once you have your, uh, your Kraken installed, I will show you later how to install it. Um, it will call, it will first will review if in your computer you have an installation. It will tell you if it's missing or if it's not. Then it will import the library as cause, right? Then let's define a, a very simple surface. So we will create the plane, the object's plane, which is a cause of the Kraken OS type and surf class, right? It will have a thickness of zero because it will be plane and a diameter of th 30 millimeters. These units are in millimeters, right? Uh, then we will create a surface, which is six millimeters in thickness. It's made of air and has a diameter of 30 millimeters, the same as the object plane. And finally, we will define the image plane, right? Then we will char chart, um, charge our configuration setup and define the um, object that will have all of the optical elements. In this case, we only have one optical element. Then we will create the lens system, which is the, the optical system, the complete optical system, which is composed of the optical elements and the configuration. And then we will have the ray keeper, right? And I will show you a, a 3D visualization of this example. 
this is what, if you click enter, you will see this. It's used by Vista to create. Then we have the image plane, the object which has, I don't remember the, the dimensions, 30 millimeters in diameter, six millimeters in thickness, and the, ob the object's plane, okay? Let's, it will, they will be progressive, so we will re be retrieving our previous example. Let's create a simple lens. So, again, we, we, we define the object's plane, the object's, in this case, it's made of BK7 glass, right? It's the same, like, in instead of pair, it's made of BK7 glass, which is the, the most typical glass used to construct optical elements. Um, in this case, it will have a shape. It will have a radius of curvature of, of like, like I said, minus 50. It, it will have a belly. Um, and the image plane, again, the distance to the object, to the elements, the configuration, again, this is repeat. Um, I, uh, later, I will show you how to trace because this will have, in another example, many, many rays, right? Um, in this case, I will show you a 2D uh, visualization, which will be like a transversal cut. So, the object's plane, the first lens, the first phase of the lens, the second phase, which have the min mi minus 50 millimeters curvature, and the image plane. Okay, like you can see that it's very, very straightforward. Then let's trace some rays. So I will show you later uh, another for another way. This is the, the long <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry. This is the long way to, to do this. So we will have the, the coordinates of the origin of the ray, the, di the direction cosines, in and the wavelength. And we will use a ray trace keeper to, uh, to save these characteristics. And the ray patch, ray dot patch, only saves the calculation of the interaction after save interaction, right? We need to, to save this after every surface. Then we will have another ray of another wavelength. This is 500 uh, nanometers, this is 400 nanometers. And we will trace them over the lens that we built before. Then we can see, okay? We have the origin coordinates, they will intersect, and then after the calculations that I, I discussed, they will change angle. This is the visualization in 3D. And, and let's talk about the, an, an aspheric surface. Um, I told you that this Sagitta equation is the general equation for conic surfaces. However, most, for example, new telescopes include asphericity terms in their construction. They are not parabolic, they are not hyperbolic, they are aspheric, okay? They will, of course, be will have a basis on a conic surface, but they will include uh, coefficients of a, a polynomial expansion of another term that will modify the surface, and they are used to correct the wave front, okay? More, um, they are used mostly in wide field telescopes because we will have many aberrations, right? In the wave front. So let's create an aspheric surface. Taking, like I said, the example before. Imagine that we have here the lens, the single lens. Then we will, instead of have, we will have the, the belly, but with, with the same uh, uh, radius of curvature, the same thickness, the same diameter, but then we will include these three coefficients for the asphericity terms, okay? And we will store them in this. Now, we will have the object's plane, the first, lens, first phase of the lens. We will have the asphericity, the aspheric surface in the second phase, and the image plane. We will trace the rays and display them in 3D. Ah, oops. We have here a one. It can be a zero, one, or two, or three. What we do, what this do is to remove a, a 
a fraction of the image just for visualization, okay? And then, like I said, this is not a conic surface, this is a atmospheric surface. It's trying to focus the rays. Let's perform a geometric transformation. I'm, I'm reaching a telescope. I'm trying to build, build a telescope, okay? <laughs> I will include a 45 degrees inclined mirror to focus the light. This is another way of doing what we done we have done before. We have the objects plane with it's it's flat, it doesn't have a curvature radius, thickness, glass, diameter. We have the same ah in this case I'm working with um an achromatic doublet. It it this is a kind of, of lens that corrects for um chromatic aberration, right? It will have different in refraction indexes that will compensate and try to focus the all colors in the same point. That's why we have a first lens, an interface lens, surface, and a third lens. Um, this is some a distance that, that we'll use. And here we are creating a 45 degrees mirror. Remember that table that I showed you? This is the tilt x option, right? We will and in here we are creating our system. Um, the first surface, the interface surface, the third surface, the flat mirror, the image plane, the configuration. Ah, and here I'm creating in a for loop many rays, right? I will not provide many details in here, just we have an hexapolar distribution of rays, they are distributed in an hexagonal form, and there's they have some angle between them, and they have some space in between them. Okay, and we have the the size of the, the system, and we we don't want rays to come from outside, right, <laughs> of the system. So we're limiting to the size of the doublet. Um, we have the core the origin coordinates, which are related to the, the these parameters that I told you, and the direction cosines, the wavelength, etc. And they will be traced over the doublet that we created before. And this is the result, right? We have the object plane, the doublet, the chromatic doublet. We have the 45 degrees tilted mirror, and it will focus all the rays in here, right? So this is like, like I said, like nearing to a telescope. <laughs> Let's design a wide field telescope. Let's create a wide field cassie grain telescope with the following characteristics. It will have a focal ratio of f over four. It's very slow telescope. It has a very large field of view. It has a diameter of 1.3 meters. It's very small. Well, <laughs> according to modern standards. Um, it has a four order correction, a spherical correction lens behind the secondary mirror, the primary mirror, and the, the size of the primary mirror, which in this case will be flat, it will not be parabolic, and the separation between mirrors, the working distance between mirrors, which is the distance from the vertex of the primary to the focal plane, the curvature radius of the mirrors, uh, I, there's an, er an error here, <laughs> one of them is flat, and the conicity constant for the primary mirror, which is a parabola. Right. Then, um, it's just the f we we're just defining the object's plane, the first mirror, the secondary mirror. We're stating the position of the primary vertex, mirror vertex. The correction lens, which some spherical um, coefficients, um, the. Um, the image plane, well, you see, it's sequential, right? It's just retrieving what we've done before. And then we trace them. We can see, like, what is that? A Cassegrain telescope with a correction plane, correction lens. But there's a problem with this telescope. If all of you that have performed observations have had the problem to focus your images, right? You have to focus your images. And how do you do that? We displace the secondary mirror, 
to try to reach the best focus. Most telescopes are heavily aberrated, no? and you will have a compromise <laughs> with the aberration. In this case, this telescope, even though it has a correction, correction lens, it still have comma aberration, right? And chromatic aberration, and spherical aberration, <laughs> all aberration, okay? So I will not show you this, this optimiza optimization function because it's more complex, but we can create an iterative process of displacing and tilting our secondary mirror to reach the best fox, which is what we will do physically, right? And we will take advantage of the root mean square error to reach the best, the, m the large energy concentrated in the least ar area, right? Well, that's hi here, for example. I, I will show you more examples, but where can you get Kraken noise? Well, you go to pip install Kraken noise. It's already uh, included in as a suite in Python. You will, of course, have to upgrade and install some some utilities from Python, or you can go to to, to GitHub. Um, we have Joel Herrera is the leader of this pro project. Uh, we have already published uh, the the description of Kraken, um, but the the editorial was uh, they liked it that much that they asked us for to write an extended, not article, but book for use, user's book. Like not a manual, but more examples of how to use Kraken OS because the functionalities are, I, I show you like the, the tip of the iceberg, right? And then if you fall madly, madly in love with Kraken, you can buy your back, a book. <laughs> it will be, po it's already accepted. It will be published sometime this year. It's already in production. What's next for Kraken? Well, we still, like I said, Kraken is not competing with CMAX in terms of capabilities. But in terms of precision, you can go to, the, to, to our paper and you can see that our precision is the same, at the same level of CMAX. Of course, the difference is the velocity, right? So we want to improve on our graphical environment, um, include GPU programming with Python and CUDA to be able to, most of the processes are, paral are para parallelized, okay? Don't you think it's not parallelized, but it's not enough. We still need to use NVIDIA power, right? To try to improve our velocity of calculation. Just to, to improve the performance of Kraken, but the precision is there. So I will, I still have time. I still have time. <laughs> okay, I will show you three more examples of applications that we are working in right now. So these two of them are, are PhD thesis of my students, and one of them is the multi-agent uh, multi optimization system for optical systems in nonlinear in, in English it's redundant. <laughs> I just realized. Well, we are working in collaboration with the United Kingdom and Argentina to develop uh, an instrument. It's a multi-channel camera that will be installed in Casleo Observatory in, in Argentina. It <coughs> it's a 2.1 meters telescope and it will focus on transient um, events, astronomical transient events. So this has to, um, th the cameras will be very fast in, in, in the um, high Cadmus domain of astronomy. And the requirement is to build a focal reducer for the telescope because they want to focus the beam of the telescope and split split it in three cameras at the same time. Okay? Oop. Oop. I forgot. Ah, it's in here. I don't know why I put it that. So it will cover the whole visual spectral range. The telescope, the, the beam of the telescope will come in from here. We will have some dichroic, which are like I told you, the do achromatic doublets to focus the light. Some of that will be semi transparent. And well, this is the design, the conceptual design. So, what is Morgan doing? 
he is working on the tolerance analysis of this object. He needs to calculate the optimal focus, the optimal uh, placement of the elements, the, mm, well, that, in order to correct for the, the majority of the aberrations. Of course, it will, it will not be free of aberration, but there's another requirement that <coughs> the three cameras must have the same size, N not size, but angular size of observation. Okay, they will be CMOS, CCDs, they will have 2,000 uh, pixels of 15.5 micrometers each, but the size of them, the plate scale of the three cameras should be the same. And you, you, you might think, oh, it's, uh, it's easy, but it's not easy <laughs> because the space is very small. So Morgan is trying in to, to optimize that design. And for that, we need to take advantage of Seidel sums, which describe each of the optical aberrations that maybe you have heard. Spherical, coma, astigmatis astigmatism, Petzval field curvature, and chromatic aberration, right? <coughs> I, I show you that example that I didn't show you the, the code to reach the best focus, but that's the classical approach to performing this calculation. You, I, iteratively, we will reach an optimal solution. But what Morgan will do, it will take advantages, advantage of, of artificial in intelligence and he's using by inspired algorithms to create a set of different solutions to reach the optimal solution, okay? So we, will don't we won't have some so much dependence on the tolerance, but we will have in, in, ch in exchange a complete set of solutions that might work. For example, they want to include free forms or uh, instead of common regular glasses, they will have, they, they want to include glasses of free form, it, they are called free form, which can be <laughs> like a very small uh, adaptive optic system in that space. So it will be a challenge. And um, well, we, we, we have some, we define the health parameter, which is a quali quantitative parameter that will determine if our solution is the best, okay? But not only that, this is a large collaboration that it's planning to install several instruments across the world. And Argentina, it's the second one. The, the, the next will be in South Africa. And Morgan will create the, uh, the seat for developing all the uh, other instruments. It will be very nice. OK. So some of my colleagues in the astrophysical and the stellar group might be familiar with my work. I try work with speckle interferometry, and I will show you an example of what I'm doing right now. So we again, we have an hexapolar uh, distribution of light, of ray light. Um, I, I'm let me explain what I want to do. I want to create uh, a, a star and see how it will be affected by the atmospheric turbulence. Okay, I want to model that. You can do that through a Kolmogorov, Kolmogorov turbulence mask, right? <laughs> but I want to model that. I want to see it in real time. So I'm including here a phase shift, which is calculated through the Cernic polynomials, which are related to the Kolmogorov turbulence, right? And then, well, I, I will show you the result. <laughs> this is a, a, a star that has been uh, aberrated through Fraunhofer diffra diffraction, right? I, we have a circular aperture and of the telescope. We have the, the, turmo the Kolmogorov turmo turbulence uh, mask, and we have the source point. This is a convolution of all these effects. And you can see that it's out of focus because it has comma aberration. Um, you, you cannot see the all the waves because of the light, but <laughs> they are there. And then, let me show you this. Uh, I think this is, 
stops. Of course, it is not going to work. <laughs> Let me see. Ah, there. This is a speckle gram. This is a speckle image. So what we are seeing, it's a very amplified star. Like this is a binary star. And each of these speckle, it's a diffraction limited image of the star before after passing through the atmosphere. They are reaching the focal plane and they are overlapping. They are all at the diffraction limit. You are seeing many iri disks of of the of each star overlapping. That's why it's called interferometry. They are interfering, right? This is how we see stars through the telescope. And after that, we perform an analysis over there to calculate astrometric parameters and photometric uh, calculation. And let me show you this. This was created using crack, okay? The code that I showed you before. Why am, am, am I doing this? To in order to calculate the astrometry, the astrometry of the bind of of stars of using speckle interferometry, <laughs> we have to be very creative. It's a very artisanal manual technique, <laughs> and what I'm doing right now is creating. Uh, a, gr a grid of models of many configurations of separations of position angles in sky and magnitude difference to create, uh, like I said, a grid of models, right? And then through and neural al neur neuronal networks, I'm going to classify my objects and calculate astrometric parameters. Okay, because I can ca I can control all the astrometric parameters in Kraken, right? And then I can use artificial intelligence to match my results and then get what I want, which is the astrometry. The photo calculate the, the position of the photo center of the speckles. I will not do it in in this space. I will do it in real space. I'm not showing you that. And finally, um, using Kraken, because Kraken is a ray tracer, another one of my students was interested in simulating gravitational lenses in the weak, len in the weak lens regime, right? And I, I, I will not provide some details. I will just show you some images using a modified version of Kraken, because Kraken works, uh, like I said, with, physic with geometric physics. So in order to include um, mass distributions, we have to change the, the core of Kraken, okay? This was, um, this is a, an Einstein cross, and then he tried, <laughs> this is just plain, 40 million solar masses and 3 million rays in the weak region, okay? So I'm showing you these examples because you can use Kraken for the only limit is your creativity, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Obrigada, Carlos, pela apresentação. É, alguém tem alguma pergunta? Vou perguntar em português, Vai. tá bom? Aí você responde. Vou responder é, em espanhol. Tá bom. <laughs> É, então, no, no seu departamento lá, vocês têm um, um grupo de, de desenvolvimento de instrumentos, de instrumentação astronômica no, no observatório? Isso, sim, sim. E aí vocês fazem, vocês desenvolvem instrumentos tanto pra, de acordo com a demanda interna do observatório, mas também para outros institutos. Isso. E aí vocês desenvolveram esse Kraken aí justamente para atender as demandas do próprio grupo, foi isso? Não, né? não. No, Kraken was. Uh, well, posso responder em português? Claro, como você quiser. <laughs> no, Kraken foi criado por puro prazer, né? <laughs> <laughs> Mas aí a gente começou a ver as possibilidades e aí ele. Um, 
o, o Rafael Herrera é o óptico do observatório. Então, ele ele que tem agora o a liderança né dos, dos projetos de, de instrumentação. Então, ele pensou, bem, a gente pode usar a Kraken para otimizar. Foi assim. Né? Mas, sim, é, o grupo de, de desenvolvimento de instrumentação astronômica do Instituto tem colaboração em muitos institutos. Por exemplo, Gran Tecan tem um instrumento que foi feito no México. Né? Então, agora vai ter a Argentina, Sul América, Sul, Sul África. Ah, então assim, na hora do cafezinho ali, foi, ah, vamos foi. fazer um... <risos> sim, sim. Aí, falei, ele é o líder do projeto, aí eu, eu, quando eu cheguei lá, eu vi o projeto dele e eu adorei, então aí começamos a fazer a colaboração. Né? E, é, eu queria ter as ferramentas de programação que ele tem, mas eu estou aprendendo, né? eu estou indo. Ah, legal, legal, Pô, legal. Uhum, Valeu, obrigada. É mais alguém? Oi, Carlos. É, você já fez, algum, já fez alguma comparação com observações mesmo, utilizando é, os, as simulações? Por exemplo, essas de ondas gravitacionais, por exemplo. Já tentaram ver com observações? Sim, com, sim. Por sim. exemplo, essa aqui eu mostrei aqui. Essa é o, a cruz de antes, a primeira. Então, a gente uhum. modelou, botamos a distribuição de massa que eles sugeriram e tudo isso. O que é... Ainda queremos fazer, que é, na verdade é o projeto dele, o projeto não é fazer o simulador, o projeto dele é reconstruir a morfologia da galáxia antes de ser é, deformada pela lente gravitacional. Hum. Então, pelo menos esse aí já, sim, já fez, já foi. E com os outros, por exemplo, interferometria que você utiliza, já fez também? Já, já. já. A gente tem, modelo, por exemplo, falando da instrumentação, né, temos, estamos, que tem muitos projetos aí, né? Tem o... Não sei se vocês... Vocês usam Excel. Algum de vocês usa Excel. Uhum. Como você faz suas propostas de observação? É, Como calcula os, os negócios? É, na verdade, normalmente eu utilizo grandes levantamentos. Então, ele já vem... Já vem são os dados já observados. Ah, né? por isso. Ah, ok, ok, ok. Então. Faz tempo. Foi, o último foi no Gemini. Eu não, não me lembro... Bem, você está dizendo que o tempo de... Sim, tempo de exposição, sinal ruído, toda Ah, sim, não. Tem, a gente utiliza lá o a próprio cálculo. Do S, é, o né? cálculo lá do Gemini e tudo. Isso, mas se você procura em outros observatórios, não tem. Então, no que a maioria das pessoas fazemos é ir no, na calculadora do, do Gemini, do, do, uh -huh. da ESO. Né? Então, com o Kraken a gente modelou, nosso, porque também temos um Michel, e agora estamos criando uma calculadora de tempo de exposição ah, para o observatório. Legal. <risos> Sim. É. Salve, Carlos. Parabéns pelo trabalho. É... Primeiro comentário que muito... Excelente a aplicação do, da programação orientada a objeto, né? Que você apresentou a superfície, apresentou o sistema. Eu já estava aqui. Cadê os raios? Sim. Aí você apresentou os raios, né? Então, muito, muito legal. E aí dentro de, dessa, desse, desse último comentário, que ah, até já me perdi qual é <risos> do da comparação do Echelle, né? Ah, okay, okay. É, que tipo de, de calibração cê, você comparou, né? Que tipo de calibração você precisou fazer para levar da simulação para a observação física? E o uhum. que você precisou amarrar? Você fez algum forward modeling? Como é que foi isso? Sim, bem, é, a gente tem as, calibra as lâmpadas de calibração, né? então elas são bem caracterizadas, a gente tem, na verdade foi isso que fizemos na... Um, o um a um das comparações. Então, a gente modelou a física, a, a, o sistema óptico do Echel, com as características do, do, do fabricante, e vimos se as, os interferogramas batiam. Né? Então, a gente conseguiu reproduzi-los. Então, de, o que fizemos depois, porque a gente conhece as a wavelength, conhece as posições das, das linhas, então, foi fazer uma calibração empírica, foi isso que fizemos. Sim. Mas não é suficiente para ficar fazer a calculação... A, a calculação? Fala. A, o, cal, o cálculo. <risos> Viu? Por isso não quer falar. 
Para hacer el cálculo, dos tiempos de exposición, você ainda tem que colocar os tipos espectrais, tem que botar uma livraria gigante de estrelas. Né? Então, esse é outro, outro negócio. Mas a, a, a caracterização do, do instrumento já foi feita, tá? fechada. E não só desse, mas dos outros espectrógrafos também. Carlos, obrigado pelo seminário, foi ótimo. É, só fiquei com uma dúvida ali no caso do Speckle, quando você uhum. mostrou. Uh, a ideia, então, de vocês usarem o Kraken para o Speckle é para fazer simulação ou você já está pensando em fazer uma redução automática, tipo um pipeline, ou pensando em fazer uma grade de modelos? O que, é que vocês estão imaginando exatamente para o Speckle? Mm, ok, então, o pipeline de processamento, eu falei que um, do, outro dos meus estudantes está fazendo agora, né? porque é muito chato, são muitos detalhes para processar esses dados. Então, não, o, o, a parte de inteligência artificial é uma coisa que ainda está em desenvolvimento, que se algum de vocês está interessado, é, <risos> é, seria para fazer o cálculo do, do ajuste astrométrico. Né? Uma vez que você tem agora os, os espectros de potência, então, aí que você vai modelar neles. Né? Porque você, se você conhece a distribuição dos, dos objetos no céu, então aí você conhece a astrometria antes de ser deformada pela atmosfera. Então, quando você calcula o espectro de potências, então aí você já sabe qual é a separação das franjas, qual é o ângulo das franjas, qual é o contraste das franjas. Então, se, se, se você cria uma, uma, uma grade de modelos disso, depois você vai comparar com um observado, então aí você faz o um match. Isso que ainda estou a fazer. É aí que, que vai entrar o, as redes neuronais convolucionais. Entendi. E vocês estão usando redes neurais, né? Que você falou, né? Mas vocês pensam em utilizar também outra ferramenta de, de sim, sim. machine learning? Ou um não? negócio que são bem... Elas são ótimas para classificação binária. E um, eu também tento deep learning. Não sei se ainda vou, vou por aí. Mais alguém? Uhum. Se ninguém mais tem uma pergunta, eu tenho uma pergunta. É, eu vi que vocês é, assim, levam em consideração as problemáticas do instrumento, né? problemáticas uhum. instrumentais. Sim. Vocês levam em consideração as questões de difração de acordo com o filtro, ou só do, de filtros utilizados na observação, ou só o aparelho? Só, só a parte de lente? Né? Não, não, não. Tudo tem que ser levado em consideração. Então... Hum. Tem, tem uma coisa que é chamada de análise de tolerância. Né? Então, aí que você faz todo o estudo e da caracterização de todos os elementos ópticos. Então, se o seu instrumento vai levar filtros, então você tem que considerar, por exemplo, essa câmera aqui, eu falei, ela vai trabalhar nesses canais. Né? Mas, para poder trabalhar nesses canais, vai precisar filtrá-los. Então, com certeza, ali. Aqui tem o filtro. Então, cada um deles tem seu próprio filtro, né? com certeza. Então, você leva em consideração todas as coisas físicas que poderiam acontecer. Na maioria, na, na medida do possível, né? mas também não é impossível simular tudo. Eu fico assim, né? com essa aí, a, acho que foi o que você apresentou com o instrumento do Caio Leu, certo? Sim. Sim. É possível, assim, como você disse que o código é aberto, implementar informações de... Qualquer observatório ou só Isso, específico? bem, é que eu não, eu falei, não, não posso mostrar tudo, mas tem uma tabelinha das configurações ópticas do telescópio de Casleu. Então, eu, eu mostrei aqui, por exemplo, aqui no desenho, não foi aleatório. <risos> Esse desenho aqui, essas características aí são de um dos nossos telescópios no observatório. Eles agora estão sendo... Não construídos, porque já foram construídos, finalizados. Agora, chegaram, de fato, ontem chegaram as câmeras para começar. É um projeto que existe lá no México para observação de objetos transneptunianos. São três telescópios que têm um campo enorme, que tem uma lente de corretora né, para diminuir as aberrações. E aí eles são redundantes. Então, eles vão observar para fazer uma triangulação de objetos transneptunianos e evitar falsos positivos. Então, é esse telescópio que eu estou mostrando aqui. Mas, para o caso Leo, também a gente tem as, os parâmetros físicos de construção para poder op otimizar o... Isso, então, é possível isso. alterar a informação de Consegue. acordo com, com o observatório que está... Sim, sim. Por exemplo, aqui, né? Eu vou ter o espelho primário, aí você muda o, o raio de curvatura, esse é um, um espelho de um metro e meio, aí o caso é 2.15. Então, 
Vamos mudar todo aí. Obrigada. É, no YouTube não temos perguntas. Sim, é a mesma coisa para você poder fazer, a, não fazer, para você poder caracterizar a distribuição espectral de energia, necessita no mínimo três pontos do espectro visível. Não pode fazer isso com dois pontos, pode fazer com mais, mas é, é isso, o negócio, o custo econômico vai o cu, né? Então, por isso que precisa de três canais mínimo, não mínimo. Carlos, muito obrigada. Obrigado. Uhum. Agradecemos a participação de todos, do YouTube também.